Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I am going to talk about doing some research uh, a few years ago. And a few years ago, um, I was doing research actually in an elementary school. And I don't moonlight as someone with an interest in child development or psychology or anything. I was actually there to see a document that they had from the 17th century. Um, and so I was in this elementary school. I was through the door right back there. Um, and I was seated at a very small chair, on a very small chair and a, at a very small table. And I was waiting for a rather pained assistant professor to bring me this document that he wishes that they didn't hold from the 17th century. And I was kind of thinking, like, I'm totally in the wrong place. How did I end up in this very wrong place? And there were really two reasons that I was there. And the first was because I thought they had just miscatalogued the, um, I thought they had just miscatalogued the document. I, I thought, you know, like it has a title super similar to another document that I've already seen. I'm just going to run this thing to ground to figure out whether it actually is different. But, you know, I mean, that librarian at the elementary school, the odds that maybe they made a mistake, you know, who knows? So I'm already not being super. Um, respectful of my environment, something that the kids kicking the soccer ball around outside in the patio screaming probably could have taught me. The other reason that I was there is because I had a free place to stay nearby. Um, and so because Amparo would just let me stay at her house for months, um, I wasn't in a center that was sort of famous for massive collections. Um, I was going to all the libraries that I could walk to, um, and those included a lot of elementary schools. Um, and so I was thinking, this is not, this being in the wrong place, this is not what my career was supposed to be like. This is not like all the people that I see on Facebook and everything who are in super cool places. Like I thought that like my career would start at very, I would be at very cool libraries, right? And we're like maybe, vampires were sensing the presence of witches. <laughs> and then after that, I would graduate to stupendously cool <laughs> libraries. But there I was, like in my little chair, at my little table, waiting for my single sheet print document. And that was another thing that made me think like, holy cow, like this is, how is this my career? Because I thought like the normal trajectory of an early modernist was, okay, you start with print stuff. Right, and it's kind of junky. And then you graduate to slightly cooler manuscript things, right? But a little bit homely, but whatever, you know, has some charm. And then eventually you move up to like illuminated manuscripts. Um, and then, like, maybe right before you get tenure, like Leonardo. <laughs> I'm not waiting for Leonardo, right? Like, and so. I was thinking to myself, like, what's going on? So I get the document. I'm right behind these kids, kicking around the soccer ball. And then I start to read the document. And then I realize this document has things that aren't actually in manuscripts because the problem it's talking about never went to trial. And what it says in this document is that a group of monks in the city of Saragossa were given a royal privilege to make and sell medicines. And not only was that the case, they were allowed to sell medicines and allowed to be overseen not by the regular governing body, not by the College of Boticarios or, or physicians of the city of Saragossa, but rather by another set of monks so the state, the crown, had set up an alternative apparatus of oversight for the production and sale of medicines. And this is pretty crazy. So these were Hieronymite monks that were now allowed to make and sell in direct competition with pharmacists. They were allowed to make and sell medicines. They were to be overseen by the local charter house or the Carthusians, who are really well known for um, their distilling practices and their production of um, medicinal distillates. Uh, chartreuse is made by 
charter house Carthusians. Um, and the apothecaries had this huge problem, which was that the convent was located in a parish that was surrounded by a diocese to which it did not pertain. It actually pertained to another diocese some distance away. And so the local archdiocese said, we don't want to hear the case because this isn't our business. And the distant diocese said, we're not in Saragossa. We don't care about the College of Physicians of Saragossa. So there was like this, this jurisdictional impasse. Um, and so in this regulatory vacuum, the Crown had set up an alternative body of oversight that was apolitical in a sense. It was a really bonkers situation. And so I'm, I, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And then it starts to occur to me. Man, I've been in other elementary schools and I've seen some other weird stuff. Um, and a lot of the weird stuff I've seen is in sermons. And there are a bunch of sermons over there, you can check them out, because they're worth nothing. It's like the detritus of the 17th century. All right, and so the only thing actually that can mess up those sermons is the grease on your hands from the food or if you like knock your wine over onto it. There, it's the most stable data storage device, good paper, ever invented. Um, okay, so I'm in these libraries and I'm seeing all these sermons and in the sermons, what people are saying are things like, you know, Distillation is a way to understand the Bible. You can understand the book of Ecclesiastes and its reference, sort of primitive reference to a hydrologic cycle in which rivers run into the sea, but the sea is not full. You can understand the Bible in terms of distillation. And by the way, it was probably Enoch who invented alchemy. And so distillation was this important tool of alchemy because it purified separated the pure from the unpure. And that people, for example, in purgatory, would be like distillates. They would start as sort of opaque or cloudy, like maybe like wine, and then slowly their spirits would be volatilized until they were pure spirit, at which point they could make their way into heaven. So this idea that alchemy was present in the Bible and sort of alchemical distillation, this idea that maybe there was um, a kind of production of medicinal distillates that was similar to what was happening in the convents in Saragossa, I all of a sudden I realized this is marketing. Right? Monks want to sell distillates. Preachers are up there saying, distillates are in the Bible. And sooner or later, you are going to be purified in this very natural way, just as distillates. This is propaganda. This is the, let's, okay, not propaganda, the cultivation of a sensibility, right? <laughs> One in which the idea is our bodies function like alembics, like this distillation apparatus purifying. The earth functions that way, and it's all in the Bible. And another thing that I was noticing in these sermons, which I hadn't been paying attention to until I figured out that it was marketing, was the fact that these sermons were quoting German Protestant alchemists who in theory were on the index of prohibited books. But they're cited chapter and verse in sermons. So Andreas Libavius, who's frequently um, thought of as the father of analytical chemistry, father why? Because mostly this is German. All the, everybody's scientific discipline has a German father, I guess. Um, but yeah, so I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is starting to make sense of oh, an entire worldview and an alternative to professional medicine, a professional medicine with surgeons and physicians and apothecaries. And if you think about it, Hippocratic medicine is super time intensive because every person has a different sort of complexion balance of the humors, right? And so the physician's job is to know the patient in health, to know the patient in sickness, and then the physician then has to prescribe first diet and exercise, and then maybe some medication, and then surgery, right? It's a really complicated, intensive, analytical, therapeutic model. Man, alchemy is like, we're on our way to purification, spiritual, bodily, and 
if you take these distillates, it will remove the impurities from your body. And these are panaceas. They'll fix everything. So it's diagnostically way simpler. Um, it has a, a lot of advantages, too. Um, because if your options are cauterization or schnapps, like it's not a tough decision. <laughs> so as I was thinking about being in the wrong place, it occurred to me that, that really there were, there were two things happening. A and these are my conclusions. First, that being in the wrong place in my case was really just thinking the wrong way about the constraints to my research. And that's really what Jenny was talking about, right? Like, how do you conceive of not just the methodology, but also the shape of your intellectual project such that it will hopefully produce results and results that we don't anticipate, right? We, we don't anticipate how much students will love them. In this case, I didn't anticipate that going to a bunch of elementary schools um, would, would lead to a different understanding of the institutional conflicts that produced medical reform right about the time that Boyle is coming up with ideal gas laws if you ever had to do like PV equals NRT stuff, right? So right about this time that people are thinking about circulation of the blood, thinking about changes in pneumatics, thinking about new ways to consider physiology, there is this institutional conflict that is producing new ways of thinking about how healthcare might be administered. And so this, this, it became easier thanks to my constraints, to tell a different kind of a story. And so I tried to embrace them despite the fact that there were no vampires sensing the <laughs> presence of witches in the libraries I was visiting. Um, and the second thing is that um, those constraints also traced the shape of a human community and that human community was partly the people who loved me. The people who said, yeah, you can stay in my apartment for as long as you want. Yeah, um, you can leave for months at a time and I'll mow the lawn. Yeah, right? And, and so I think all of our research is marked, is shaped, takes the shape of the sickness in your family or the unfortunate consequence or the wonderful coincidence when you are afforded the opportunity to do, right? All those things are essentially effective um, in nature in, in ways that I hadn't really realized. And so thanks to those searches in the wrong place, I feel as though I got to tell a new story, one that I hadn't anticipated, one that I otherwise couldn't have anticipated. Um, but also, I began to be able to trace the shape of those effective relationships, to understand in a different way what it means to be a humanist. So thanks very much.